All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with more Off the Top with Rikishi Fatu. And if you tuned in last week's show, you know that we're going through the Bloodline timeline. And right now, we are going to be at 1992. And, of course, that's going to be when the Head Shrinkers signed with the WWE uh, F at the time. Uh, Big Keish, now, before we even get to uh, before you, when you signed with the WWF, yeah, man. What what were the rumblings like uh, before your contract came? Like, uh, did Afa or Sig did someone smarten you up? Hey, listen, uh, uh, Junior, <laughs> you're gonna get. I mean, we we know what. Yeah. we know about the story. Of them uh, pre match yeah. getting slapped around and stuff. But this is before you even I debuted. Got you. We're not there Kinda yet. Like when we got the call. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we in Pensacola, Florida. You know, during the time we used to work on the shipyards, emptying out containers. So this was me, Yoko. And TK, the Tonka Kid. And so we would go into these, uh, out the shipyard, and inside these containers, they would have like a 120 pound flour bags in like a potato sack, mm -hmm. right? So we get up and you gotta go down there, and it's almost like, you know, you're going and you're, you're raising your hand. The guy comes out that runs a whole deal, and then he'll look at certain people, and then of course he'll pick the person that, you know, just gonna work. So the guy that used to do that was one of our friends, mm -hmm. right? So we knew even if we came late, we was getting the job, right? Because Yoko didn't, you know, Yoko took his time to do a lot of things. <laughs> you know what I mean? So so anyhow, we got the job. Now we, we start, uh, you know, working from, uh, I believe it was from uh, 8 to 2 p.m., right? And they'll put like, you know, four people in one container. And so the people that didn't get, uh, picked, you know, Yoko would, you know, actually tell the guy, hey, you want to come work for me? So the guy says, all right, he says, you can take my place here, but the only thing is I want half of your pay, <laughs> right? So we were making $30 a day, right? So we get in there and it doesn't go up like how many containers you, mm -hmm. you just 30 bucks a pay. So, but we would always make sure that we're all together. We wouldn't separate ourselves to go with other people right. emptying up other containers. So when we did that because so we can help each other out. You know, if one got tired, we tell him to rest and blah, blah, blah. It jumps back. Yeah. So in the meantime, you know, when you're rubbing your fingers up against these, you know, potato sacks, you know, like flour sacks, you know, it cuts through your bones and stuff like that. And so, and then not to mention in Pensacola, Florida, it's like 100 degrees in them damn containers. So you're just sweating and everything. So me and my brother, GK, I mean, it was in good shape, you know. And it was actually good to be in there and just start tossing. They didn't, you know, back in the day, you know, bones didn't, uh, wasn't damaged or knees wasn't damaged, back was strong. So we were tossing those things like, like we were getting a good workout. Yoko, on the other hand, he would sit on the side, you know, because... His weight and sitting on the flower uh, the sack, you know, it was one of the comfortable seats. So he would tell us, don't touch that area until we finish work all the way that way. And so he would just sit there and just talk <laughs> to the whole time while we're emptying, <laughs> you know, emptying out container. And he would sit there and the other guy would work for him. So Yoko was kind of like the guy, he was like our radio, because mm -hmm. he would just start, you know, just start rapping about stuff in there, you know. TK can't keep up with Junior, you know, picking up the sack and blah, blah, blah. TK is trying to blah, blah, blah. Here comes Junior. It says, almost felt like we was in a, a, a horse race, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he just he just commentating on everything. So finally, when we finally got out, uh, we went and we got our paychecks, 30 bucks each. So 30 bucks each. Now we go to the liquor store. That right there in the, in the block, you cash your, you know, you go meet Mohammed Abib. <laughs> Mohammed Abib, how are you? What did you guys doing today? We are happy to see you. I said, Abib, what's happening? I said, listen, we got our checks here and blah, blah, blah. So, okay, what are you buying today? Because you wouldn't cash it unless you bought some. Uh -huh. So we'd get a 40 each. We couldn't wait for that beer. It was hot. And back in the day, we would get that. You remember that old English? Yes, sir. That old English, what was it like, you know, 95 cents, a, a dollar ten and stuff, mm -hmm. plus tax. Mm -hmm. So we said, we budgeting now. Okay, we'll get a couple of those. That's $2. And we got like, okay, we got like $37 left each person. 
And so we would take that now. And then, of course, we'd go to the pool hall. This is our daily system. Uh, we'd go to the pool hall. By the time we get to the pool hall, you know, catching the buses over to this place here, we would go to a place where they have all these men, like older, like that. that's all they do is shoot pool through the day. They've been sitting there, you know, away from their wives at 12 p.m., lunchtime, brunch, and we come in there about 6 o'clock. Now they're all f***ed up. Mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? This game. So we come through, and then before we get there on the bus ride, you know, my father was a pool shark. Right. So he always taught us how to, you know, we used to watch him play pool. And, uh, you know, he, he did a lot of gambling, too, and, and he did it, you know, because to make extra money to take care of us. So when we came through there, we would all say, okay, I got $37, man. I got kids at home, the Usos and, you know, the family, and so I know how big my tribe is, right? I can't afford to lose, right? Yoko had his two kids, but only this, he only had like, what, uh, half of 37, right? So he was way that low. And then TK the same. TK would leave with 37 and uh, come with 37 and still leave with 37. <laughs> we, if you know TK, he work all the angles. So then I would, we would wait and we would let these guys here, you know, we, we see them gambling, you know, and so they, you know, oh man, they gambling five bucks. So I started listening. We, you know, you know how you sit back in the locker room, you just mm -hmm. listen. Mm -hmm. The talent can't help but just, you know, just uh, expose himself. themselves. So we sitting there and now we drinking them dollar beers. You know, and then and we can hear them. They're just gambling. Five bucks, okay. The other guy does a job, and he comes, okay, $10, I'll, you know, you can try to win your money back. And so we were sitting, and then all of a sudden, I look, and TK looks at me, Yoko looks at me, and then I said, okay. So we go to the bathroom, they give me five bucks each. So now with my five bucks, that's $15. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I see that guy is up 15 bucks, I'll come and I'll place my 15 down. All right, here we go. Let's do 15, you know, one game. Soon as the guy commits, now we go inside and uh, my guy that meets us there, I pull out, it's like pulling out a damn shotgun. So I pull out my pool stick. Mm -hmm. I open the sucker up, sandpaper, do the, the norm, had my own shot. Now, you know, I got a couple brews in me, right? So then I sit there and then I play and then I do the job. So now this guy talks. Mm -hmm. He's got my he's got our 15 bucks. Yoko and those guys there, they're just sitting there laughing. So now it's just six this, you know, 15 and 15, that's 30. Mm -hmm. So now I do up this guy here. I said, okay, let's double up. Let's go 60 bucks. 60 bucks, Joey. He broke. Didn't the balls didn't go in. I got up for the first time, ran the whole table with nine ball. <laughs> now we're up. I wow. turn around and mm -hmm. I'll give uh, Yoko now ten dollars. Mm -hmm. TK ten dollars. I keep forty now. All right. So now every game now instead of five bucks, it's twenty dollars now. Mm -hmm. So by the time we the night was over, I turned around and I break off the brothers and so forth. Now they go home, and, you know take their little paycheck plus more mm -hmm. to buy groceries. We would go from there and go to, you know, to the uh, supermarket, go get some cereal and some milk, you know, to, you know, take home for the family. And, but the reason why I'm telling you this story, how this come about to get in the call, is the following day. When we got there, we didn't want to do that no more. But we went ahead and did it. Same system went over and over. Now this time here we got our beer, and then we came up and we just sat around the corner and just, you know, just taking in the breeze of Pensacola, Florida. And all of a sudden I got a call. It was uh, my own cough. So when he called and he said, hey, you know, we got a chance to do a dark match and blah, blah, blah. Now, so I'm happy, right? And then I'm thinking, okay, uh, me and who? Or all, all of us? Is it all of us? He said, no, it's going to be just just, uh, just you. And so when I got off the phone, you know, I'm looking at Yoko and my brother, like, you know, I felt bad. And I, I know I had to tell him, 
But then I just like, so I'm like, the best way to tell these guys here is just let them know. Listen, I got a call. Uncle, this is what's happening, but they only want me. Now, listen, you know, you can see they're kind of, kind of sad, you know? Like I said, but listen, you know, I want you guys to understand. Just let me get my foot in there. Once I get my foot in there, let me see what else that we can do. But I promise you guys, you know, while I'm my first paid, you know, every time I'm getting paid, that we we all going to eat together. Don't worry about bills and stuff and blah, blah, blah. So that's how that happened, man. Uh, we came through, man. And uh, before I got, after I left that, that day, the second day to go, went straight to Roman Reigns' mom's house. And she used to make all our head shrinker tights. You know, that's how you see all the palm trees and all that. So Auntie Lisa made that. She, you know, made those for us. Uh, I got over there, and she had my size right. You know, I'm, you know, one day I'm looking at dirty, freaking pants to wear to, a, uh, to clean out a container, and the next night I'm looking at these brand new, uh, wrestling, you know, tights and get ready to go to WWF. But, you know, and uh, you know the rest was history. And then, you know, here comes the slop. Before we came out and. It was it was reality then, you know. Now, when he's talking about the slap, ladies and gentlemen, if you saw last week's episode, um, pre-match. Thank you. Um, and this didn't only happen with uh, Keish. This happened with his brother. Thank you so much, Drink Master. His brother, TK. I- I've heard this story. The first time I ever heard that story um, was about TK getting slapped before his, uh, his match. I actually had it in my questions to ask you, but then you told me he did the same thing to you guys. So absolutely. So before we get to your debut match, boom, you you signed your WWE contract. Uh, w eh, sorry, WWF contract. Please tell us, like, how does, how did that feel? Because you know your life changed right then and there, right? Yeah. Well, you know, to to be able to be uh, to know that you're gonna have a full time job and uh, a paycheck that you know that's that's going to, you know, solve and help a lot of people, especially, you know, you know your kids and your family and those that are near and dear to you. You know, it's, 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 it's a feeling like, you know, it's a, it's a great, great feeling. But, you know, at the same time, the responsibility now goes to another level. I got to stay in shape. You know, I got to make sure that I'm not in harm's way. I got to make sure that when I'm out on the road, the decisions and, you know, just all the, you know, the bad vibes, I, I got to see that coming a mile away or learn how to see it and to be able to dodge left from all that type of stuff. Because, you know, at one time, nobody knew who I was. The next day, you know, you're driving through, you know, Pensacola, Florida streets and everybody's saying hello, you know, and so... It's a scary and good feeling, good meaning that the family will be okay. Scary feeling is that, am I ready for that, that change of life? You know, because now my life is on the road. My life is like, you know, the wrestlers that I see that are out there that I'm working, you know, 24-7 with, you know, the game starts, you know, the game of survival. Like who's with you, who's not, you know, who's, who's against you? You know, who's stooging you out? Who's, like, you know, really got your back? You know, uh, does, the, does the office, uh, do they see any value of me? Are they are they plotting? You know, there's just so much that goes on, man. But, you know, when you have the, the smarts of, you know, your uncles that are around you, you know, and then those that, uh, you know, used to be with them that are in the office, you know, they want to see you succeed, you know, as long as I do... Uh, you know, we do our part. It's like not to get out there and f*** up. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Because it's so easy to do, you know. And, and, you know, a lot of times that, that you know, in my mind, that I've experienced myself, uh, I experienced for myself is, you know, before you walk into different places and, of course, you had to pay for a lot of stuff. Before, you know, you'd have to stand in line for a lot of things. And now it's like you get that VIP treatment, you know. And, and I've always, like, I'm not the type of person that, that takes advantage of people. 
You know what I mean? I, I you know, I appreciate the service. I appreciate the blah, blah, but I'm going to pay mines. You know, because at the end of the day, I get it, man. That Those people, somebody paying for this meal. You know, it ain't, it's not their store to give away. It's not their restaurant to make that call. Yeah, you're a supervisor, but at the end of the day, he works for somebody. And I don't want to be that person to be able to jeopardize that guy's job because it'll always take me back. And I'll look at my fingers all the time. You see in the blood, you know, the skin peel off of my off of my fingers from tossing that 120-pound bag of flour. So feel like that makes you humble, man. And if it doesn't make you humble, well then you wasn't you you wasn't meant to get that blessing. You know, from from a big company like WWE. Meaning it's not deserved to you. Give it to another student that really was passionate about learning that really was uh, wanting to understand the ins and outs of the business, like you you earned it, man. So, again, you, you know, be, being trained up underneath here and being in the independent circuit, man, it's a lot of drama out there, Joey. Yes, sir, you already know it, man. Yes, so sir. you guys make sure you see things come a mile away and always mm -hmm. have, always have, uh, like I tell my, my niece Vaughn, always have your head on a swivel. Yes, sir. I say it to my son Samson and my kids, all the time, head on a swivel. There it is. Um, your debut match. You told us last week yeah. that something happened. Uh, so, of course, with the Head Shrinkers debut match, we're talking about uh, something happened prior to you guys going out. Uh, I guess besides you also getting slapped, uh, something happened with Tony Guerrero you were talking about that added to your intensity mm -hmm. to the poor guys that uh, were uh, the opposition in your debut match. Can you please tell us a little bit about that? Well, it, uh, Tony Guerrero. There it is, Tony Guerrero. So Tony Guerrero is an islander from New Zealand, you know, and uh, you know, I had no idea that, you know, I knew Tony was an islander, but I didn't really know that he was, a, you know, one of the agents upper out of all the agents and so forth. And so, you know, there were certain agents that I liked talking to before you're going out because you just, you know, you feel like the vibes is coming and it's what you need to hear before you go out, you know, wrestling in front of 15, 20,000 people. That's, that's gives you the, you know, the, uh, it gives you the shakes when you hear stuff like that. But for, for, for Tony Guerrero, you know, he, he was known, he was known to have, damn, and no disrespect, but he was known to have like <laughs> mouth. <laughs> bad breath? Oh, uh, no, mouth. Bad breath. And I had, you know, every time, like, you know, having lunch and stuff like that, I've never seen him do it. Mm. But people tell me he used to eat raw garlic. Like he would actually carry a bag of and just eat clothes the, of, and just eat raw garlic. That would give you bad breath, I'm assuming. So yeah. you imagine when you get ready to go out and he's coming to, okay, Junior, so <laughs> I, want, I want to make sure that you go out. And just two, five, don't go over your time now. Don't go over your time, Junior. Just five, just hawking. <laughs> Yeah, he laugh like, but you imagine like you right there. Mm, yeah. All so that face. just messed my whole concentration was just off because it just you know, uh, yeah, sh 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 mouth. So then you. It was yeah. It was like you see my face. It was like yeah, stinky. Yeah. Well, you know when you drop bombs like. You like you know you know when you had a bad meal and stuff like that like you just that 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 type of smell that just linger around your damn mustache linger around hey I respect Tony Tony Guerrero I respect you but damn it back in the day you had your mouth mouth I never I never wanted to say it to you because you might go stooge me out and fire me but <laughs> but yeah you had <laughs> mouth dog you really had <laughs> mouth. <laughs> And there it is. Drop bombs on oh. Bomb. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so you guys go out, you guys have a match. Yeah. Um, what, how was your debut match uh, as, as the Head Shrinkers? Oh, we killed it, man. We mm -hmm. went out there and, uh, you know, it was like clockwork. You know, you're working with your cousin. You've always trained with your cousin. Like, we didn't even have to call spots. It's just that nod, 
You know, when we all train and work together, whether it's Yoko or myself with, you know, Manga or Tonka Kid, you, you name it, man, it's 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 that chemistry. It's like we'll look at it, and here's the beautiful thing about speaking Samoan. Speak Samoan, your opposition, nobody else knows, mm -hmm. right? Not even the crowd knows. Right. Right? So we could be yelling out of, out of the tip of our lungs, calling out, one tackle, head spot, mm -hmm. head butt, blah, 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 in Samoan. And nobody will know what the exact, unless you're Polynesian. Right. But, yeah, so we came out there, dude, we killed it. I guess they gave us 10 minutes. 10 minutes, we had people, we had people on their seats, you know, they... We were young, 275 pounds, you know, just, you know, in a good shape. You know, we everything, body felt great. You know, the mental, you know, state of mind to be able to look in the ring. Me, when I'm looking, I see my uncle there. I see my cousin, Samu. Man, I, I'm, I'm secured, man. I'm ready. The suit of armor of the Polynesian armor is on. You know, the dynasty we here to represent. You know, the Anawai Fatu brand. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And the rest was just soon. Everything we did, man, boom. You know, you can hear that pop. When you're a wrestler, mm -hmm. you know that certain pop that fans give you. It's like they dug what just, what just, uh, what type of spot you just did, you know? Absolutely. And so when we came back, dude, yeah, you know, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Oh, that oh. was fantastic. Oh, McMahon. He was right there. Wow! You know, before you know it, boom! I guess they already made up their mind. They didn't have to. They didn't have to watch our match long, because mm. all you had to do was sit back and listen. Okay. And uh, by the time we came back, Uncle Alpha went to the other room to take care of business. We went to the you know other dressing room and we just sat there and not sat there nervous, mm -hmm. but we just sitting there like what type of numbers? Because we had confidence that they was gonna sign us, and we're just interested in what type of numbers. So, uh, yeah, man, and then got signed and, you know, got on the phone back in the day on those big-ass block phones, mm -hmm. called the family, hey, you know, we got a contract. Wow. You know, and there it is. Wow. You know, so it was all good. It just happened. Things sometimes happen overnight, and sometimes you just got to stick with it. And what made me stick with it is I'll always remember that, you know, that uh, container box, man, mm -hmm. that hot as, hot as hell, 100 degrees, and then, you know, when I got signed, Joey, I came home, I went in, uh, uh, I went into my garage and I told the boys bring my cue stick. Uh, they brought the cue stick. I went outside and I burned the cue stick inside the, inside, the, you know, one of those container things, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just one of my things I put on lock to never go back that away and to never even pick up until this day, I don't know, if, 20 some years later plus I've never picked up a cue stick ever again you played pool and I'm probably years. I'm probably the shits right now just wow. horrible my eyesight wow. is bad but yeah and so you my personal my personal you know uh do not do's is that you know I don't want to ever like to be able to go back to that route right. you know what I mean especially, right. especially you know it just gave me it gave me purpose Gave me, it gave me strength, a vision to know that, you know, all that came with that, you know, from making a $30 paycheck grow to be able to feed my responsibility was a, a scary thing for me. But at the same time, it helped strengthen my work ethic. It helped strengthen my uh, mentality of branding, uh, a mentality of you know, how can I get from A, you know, to Z? And it was always like, you know, planning ahead. See the opportunity, grab it, and do your best at it. And, you know, that first time I signed that contract with WWE Health, I was there another, what, 17, 17, 18 years. So well, yeah. there it is, man. If there you guys are listening out there... <laughs> Listen, let my story be your lessons, man. You know what I mean? Be it in professional wrestling or whatever the case may be, man. You know, entertainment. Entertainment is entertainment, you know? And just like any other job, you just got to have a plan uh, to be able to execute that. And and do you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, you know, everybody's like, everybody's body's different. Everybody's mentality is different. So for you to come tell me, no, nah, you should go that way, dude. They're not going to do this for you. Why? Because they didn't do it for you? Right. 
right? That, that, that's your story. Let me go ahead and write my own story. And so, you know, that's why, you know, you, 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 when I speak these type of things, it's nothing that's made up. These are my lessons that I lived through. And to be able to utilize this podcast that reaches worldwide, those that are tuning in, you know, weekly, you know, hopefully, I, you know, we can live, we can leave something with them. Absolutely. You know what I mean? To be able to, you know, uplift them and just, you know, you know, get, get the bag, man. Get man. the grind going and and do you. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? So um, that's my story and I'm sticking, sticking with, with it. it. That's right. Please tell us, uh, what's uh, Samu like? Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, we, please, man, uh, uh, what? Sammy is a lovable person. Yeah? But he's a jokester, too. <laughs> and so, you know, he's a... Uh, Loves playing pool, right? Loves his weed. Yes. You know what I mean? And like, he's he's always been a step ahead of everybody because back in the day, everybody messing with pills and stuff. But Sammy was always with the weed, you know, and now what? Weed's legal now, right? Yes, sir. So I was I used to tell him, man, had you would have opened up shop, boy, you would have been a millionaire right now. Uh, but he he he's a he's a funny jokester type of person, loves family. Right, loves gatherings and so forth, and he loves, he loves ribbing people. <laughs> so there is this, uh, you know, Sammy's pretty good at you know chiropractic. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys are sore. Come, come on, Sammy, can you get my neck? <laughs> come on, Sammy, get it. So when we go to the bar, like Sammy does the first thing, and he's not going to a bar unless they had a pool table. Mm. So we would freaking look for a pool table, bar with the pool, find it. Now we get there. So now Sammy would get up there. Now he would come in with a freaking pool stick, right? If he's traveling and it's not too far, like he drove to the town, he's bringing his pool stick. So he would take that pool stick out. As soon as I see that pool stick come out, I know we're drinking for free tonight. Because that's how it's a pool shark, wow. right? So he'd get on there, and of course everybody knew who he was. So they're just, you know... Happy to be playing pool with Samu, the head drinker, taking photos. He was. I was like, "Are you working or are you having an autograph signing?" What was that? <laughs> so I'm getting us these drinks. I'm getting us these. So he would play. Boom, we drinking free all night from you know people losing all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But then after, I would look over and I would see the pool table game just turned into something where everybody's looking on the floor, but everybody's around as if somebody was laying down on the floor. And you can see now that I'll come over there and I'll say, what happened? Ah, just put him to sleep. <laughs> so what do you mean you put him to sleep? You know. So he'd get in there, he'll grab guys from the back, and he'll just kind of cut the circulation off, right? Mm -hmm. Which, that's freaking crazy. And all of a sudden, when you cut somebody breathing circulation... Yeah. They go into like, you know, like they just pass out. Mm -hmm. He's done that to us many a times. <laughs> many a times. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you wake up. And when you wake up, everybody's looking at you. But you have no idea yeah. how did you get to the floor. Mm -hmm. So he would put people asleep like that to the whole people. And it was like a fun thing for everybody to just sit there. And a the guy would wake up, you know, like. <laughs> exactly. And so. He was that guy, you know, just he, he, to put it all in one sum, man, and, and uh, you know, love family, love hanging around people, love playing pool, he love his, you know, his weed. He's a happy-go-lucky person, likes to drink his beers and his Jack Daniel and Coke, and he was one hell of a wrestler. Like, I, I've never seen, I learned a lot from him. Like, we would go out, and then he, Sammy would come, and I'm looking for him, and he's sleeping underneath the table in the locker room, Joey. Mm -hmm. So it's Sammy. So he have his tights on and everything. is taped all, wrist up, taped up, right? And he's sleeping. He said, just wake me up when we're ready to go out. So we'd go into everything and blah, 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 and whatever the finish is. Boom, the music's hitting. I'm waking him up. He comes up, grabs a bottle. Boom, what's the finish? And walks out while he's wetting his hair. Wow. Then you see him go out. I, I know that he was sleeping before. But when you see him perform out there, he, to me, that's where I got that, that word of showtime player. 
because he was that handsome. He was that damn good. Like there was no spots or nothing that he would call or wanted to know. He always told me, just go out there and feel the people. And Sammy was that, man, you know. And, you know, I look for one day, you know, that the WWE is able to, you know, while Sammy's, you know, here, you know, I would love to have the world hear his story, you know, being inducted into the Hall of Fame, the WWE Hall of Fame, because, you know, the, the head shrinkers had a lot to do. It don't have to be just head shrinkers. Even they just, they just induct Sam alone as he's worked in Montreal, Canada, with such a great as Dino Bravo. You know, the greats as Rick Martel. You know, a lot of the big, uh, the Rougeos, a lot of the big uh, Canadian Montreal stars. And so he's definitely had a lot to do with paving the way up in Montreal, Canada. So, so yeah, you know, Sammy was that guy, uh, a good guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him, you know, feel free to, you know, sit by again. As long as you have some weed, man, he'll talk to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> I got to hang out love. with Samu. He sounds like a good person to hang out with. He's just fun. He's just a funny man. All Samoans are. Absolutely. We're all like that. Yes. You know, all the way from Jacob to all the mm -hmm. way to the top. Mm -hmm. We're all like that. When you when you plant that seed into your circle, you know, you expect that seed to grow as such. Absolutely. And this is why we're at, at this tree. Yes, sir. This uh, famous tree that we have called the Samoan Dynasty. The Bloodline Timeline. Wrapping it up with the Head Shrinkers, who would you consider the Head Shrinkers' greatest opponents? Oh my goodness! Um, I, I, you know what? I'd have to go with uh, man. Head shrinkers up in WWE would have to be the Steiner Steiners. Brothers. Yes, yes. Head, but SST in WCW, I'd have to go with uh, the Road Warriors. Wow. Yeah, because when we wrestled the Road Warriors, it was a mutual feeling between the two. Was happy. Obviously, you know, I, I guess they were watching us when we were in. Dallas, Texas for the Von Erics. And, uh, you know, they were talking that they needed a team to work with. They needed a new, fresh team to work with. And then in we come and we dance. I think we were married for about a year and a half. Wow. And, uh, you know, the rest was history of that. But our goals and our site was always WWE. And the banger of a match you guys had at WrestleMania 9. We're going to have a whole episode just on the WrestleMania mm. 9 match. Just WrestleMania 9 we're going to have a whole episode on. But that match was bananas. Mm. If you guys go on the YouTubes and you look up the Head Shrinkers versus the Steiner Brothers at WrestleMania 9, there's a spot in there, a very famous spot, where uh, Scott Steiner gets uh, flown <laughs> over the top rope while, I don't know if it was you or us, I'm pulling the rope down. Uh, that was me. I've never seen it before in my life. I've no. never seen it since. But it looked like you guys killed him. Um, and you, Uncle Uncle Alpha cracked him with the babu. Yes, yes, to add insult to injury. Um, that was badass. So we are going to move on to 1992 with your cousin, Yokozuna. Rodney Anawai. Okay. Yokozuna. Anawai. Anawai. No, not Anawai. Anawai. Yeah, like Hawaii. Am I saying it too hard? Hawaii. To say Hawaii. Smooth, say smooth. smooth, huh? Yeah. Yeah, Anawai. Anawai. Here you go. Just cover up Anawai. Anawai. You know how you like talking to, you know, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, what's that? Down a little bit. What's yeah, that, yeah, girl? Yeah. My Come name is now. Rodney Anawai. There you go. <laughs> I got it now. Okay. So. <laughs> Give me a yeet. <laughs> Yokozuna debuts 1992, yeah. around the, a little bit after you guys, yeah. or, or, or at the same time. Yeah. Um, how did that. How did you feel seeing Yokozuna take on a Japanese gimmick from the get? I, I, I mean, I know you're probably like, whatever, you know, as long as he's got a job. But I mean, were you behind it? Were you not behind it? How did you feel? No, I, 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 whatever they gave him, mm -hmm. I was going to be behind it. You know, the bottom line for us was, again, you know, getting that weekly paycheck. And, you know, when they start to, you know, to figure out uh, what, what type of, you know, character in professional wrestling we call it gimmicks right what type of gimmick they're going to throw on a person we knew that whatever gimmick that they threw on big rodney that his skills was good enough to bring that character alive you know and sometimes you know you have one shot at it 
But if your work is good and you are able to, you know, to perform, to be able to make this character come alive, then you might have multiple shots like I did. Do you wonder why Kishi had so many till I finally found what works for me? So back to Yoko. And so when they uh, came up with that, I like to give credit to Sergeant Slaughter. Really? Because Sarge, yeah, Sarge was the one. I believe Vince went to Sarge and said, man, he's, a, he's one hell of an athlete. But damn it, we got a bunch of Samoans already. I can't have another Samoan. So uh, come up with something. And so that's what happened. Uh, word got around, and then it came to Sarge, and, uh, you know, Sarge went and pitched. I said, hey, why don't you make him a sumo wrestler? And uh, stick Fuji with him. Then, you know, have, and then this is how all the Geisha girls came in. And, wow. And so when we uh, found out, you know, that Rodney was going to be the the sumo wrestler, right, and I'm thinking, oh, they're going to come with the whole diaper and mm -hmm. everything and blah, blah, blah. Somehow uh, Rodney uh, convinced Vince <laughs> that he'll be wearing the tights underneath the uh, the underneath the belt, the sumo belt, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so when it first came out, man, uh, his music hit. The music was the right, you know, right type of vibe for him. That doo, doo, doo. so it just fit, you know. When that music hit, and then out comes the Japanese flag with you know Fuji and Yoko. You can see, you know, like. Everybody's looking. It, it wasn't like people were mocking the gimmick or laughing at the gimmick, right? They, they were watching like, damn, mm -hmm. this is a new breath of fresh air, right? Didn't know which route that they were going to go with him, but they put him in the ring. You see a big, you know, a 600, I think 40 or 50 pound dude, like just lightning speed, lightning, you know, light on his feet. Every bump he, you know, gave was just, everything was believable. Like, you never seen something like that there. Like, you you see big earthquake. You see big tugboat. You seen big guys like Kamala, right? But you didn't see a guy like this. All kind of looked the same body figure. But when you see this guy here move, Yoko separated himself from everybody. And it was an instant, instant hit. Like, I'm sure Vince McMahon, the whole crew was just happy that they stumbled onto this. And now they got a main player as far as being a heel. And, you know, the rest was history, man. They they lit up the... They lit him up from, from underneath, man, and pushed Yoko to the sky, man. Yes, yes. You know, and you start dropping, you know, you start dropping all the names like... You know, everybody was just, uh, you know, we were on to build Yokozuna, you know, back in the day. This is WWF. I mean, in comes Lex Luger. Now it's, you know, USA versus Japan. You know, that angle. We're kind of going after, like, the Sergeant Slaughter and Iron Sheik type of angle, right? Right, right, right. And so for, you know, they put the belt on Yoko. And, uh, you know, you know, when we're watching Yoko, we're riding with him too, right? We're just so happy, right? And they put the belt on him. We're riding that night, and we were, we were so happy for him. And he was just, you know, his word is like, you know, time for us to eat. Time for all of us to eat. So when we would go places, you know, WWE would put him into these, you know, high-class hotels. You know, me and Sammy and stuff, we see it. We was kind of that mid Carter, like just we were still motel. The red roof, or something. yeah, red roof, motel in six, you know, motel six and mm -hmm. motel eight. Mm -hmm. But Yoko would, you know, come sleep with, you know, come sleep in my place. Uh, so his his room were always like big suites and stuff. Wow. Yeah, and Yoko dog man, he walked through there. He was like the like the freaking president of Japan, man. You know, people that work at the hotel, man. He, anything he wanted, you know, he they have it sent up to the room and so forth and. So it was that, you know, he, he shared his blessings. You know, he even not only with the family, but, 
entire family, that those that asked for help or needed needed a helping hand. And even the boys, mm -hmm. they love Rodney, man. You know, it, it, I, I don't know anybody that, that had beef with Yoko, that, you know, had a bad thing, even a bad thing to try to say about because if they did, it's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. He's not that person. He's just a, a loving type of person, a giving person, a good father, love, I mean, love all the kids in the family and even any other kid he didn't didn't know, right? Uh, loved, loved the community, in, uh, you know, here in Los Angeles. He, him and his uh, late parents, you know, uh, his father worked for the church and, uh, you know, he would uh, send some of his, his tidings to the church in the community and so forth. You know, but he was that, man. Loved his kids, man. He just got a, a son and a daughter. The, the, you know, they were his world, man. You know, they they were babies when he passed away. But now they, you know, they've seen the documentary that WWE had put out. And, you know, they're old enough. They were in the documentary. They're old enough to right. really listen and hear what, you know, all these different icons of the industry, you know, talk about the feelings of, what you know their father was and is right and uh you know it's a beautiful thing for them to understand i think they're at peace uh to be able to know that their father did some good not only you know always in the family but around the industry and around the world so absolutely yeah he, he you would have loved him joey i mean it, you better come up with some good rap some freestyling rap because he was that guy all the time i'm gonna get to that let's uh speaking of you yeah. mentioned his title run what did you feel about the finish at WrestleMania 9? So he had a 30-second title run um, at WrestleMania oh, I, 9. Yeah, I thought that was bullshit. I, I wanted, I wanted I, to. I, no, I'll, I'll say it for you. Yes, sir. That was bullshit. You know, I mean, come on. You know, WrestleMania 9. This guy worked, I mean, to help, the, you know, did his part for the company. You know, finally get to the, you know, to the WrestleMania deal here. I mean, give him his flowers. Right. You know what I mean? Hogan Hogan was already established already. Mm -hmm. You know, Rodney worked for it all the way through. Not to say Hogan didn't work, but it was bad timing, Hogan. Bad <laughs> timing. That's what I say. <laughs> you know, you should have, you know, at least, you know, if it was a move from the company, obviously, or it might have been a power move from you, but whatever the hell it was, man, you know, just, just hope to God the Samoans don't find out what it was. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I, I'll never know what it is. You know, my Uncle Alpha, anybody doesn't talk, it's, you know, we, I, I'm, I know Hogan, but I'm not close to Hogan. Yes, sir. He's close to my Uncle's Alpha and Seeker, right? Right. Uh, for me, like, you know, his son used to train with us at Knox Pro. And uh, when they was doing that, Hogan's best, you know, we damn whooped his, his son's and damn whooped Hogan's. Too, now right? I heard I heard it was because uh, the son was so uh, the son was showing well, up late. Well, he, okay, so just because we told him mm -hmm. from the beginning, you're not getting no special treatment. Right. When you come to Knox Pro Academy, you whether you're a superstar or a reality TV star, we don't give a. F you're gonna. These are the rules. You're gonna show up. You're gonna put in work like everybody else. What this cat do? On the day of, first of all, we open up the door so his father can come shoot that show no, Hogan's Knows Best, right? But obviously, he didn't because homeboys didn't check his son to make sure that time-wise, always be on time. What'd he do? He shows up and just, you know, nonchalant and walk in with his girlfriend. Oh, he brought his girlfriend. Black Pearl says, okay. He looks at me. I look at Pearl. And I'm looking at him. I said, you already know the drill. We Do, do we need to? He gets in there and start do, taking bumps. So you're supposed to take like 50 bumps. Sir. Right? He got, I think it was only like at, at I don't know, 12 or who knows. See, here comes the selling now. So Hogan got hot. He, this story has never been true. He got hot and he says that, uh, uh, what he said to Reno, he says that Reno has an, an ego. <laughs> Right to make his son bump like that, so we we, we said, "Are we shooting here? Are we?" Because the cameras is on, so we end up kicking him out, get out of here, right? And so you know the thing is with Reno, say Black Pearl, yes sir. 
in case you wrestlers, like, this is one Samoan, I would say don't ever try to cross this guy here, right? I mean, we all can hold our own. Number one there, this guy here, a true, true Samoan high chief, Pau Purumakau. That's a big name. Google it. That's a big name in the islands. Number two is this guy here is a very smart guy, right? Graduated in Chico, criminology. So now he's smart as far as criminal, <laughs> right? So, and then number three is, dude, he whooped almost a lot of people's asses back home in the islands. A lot of people, Mike. This guy here, he, I mean, before uh, UFC, there was Black Pearl. Because he just, you know, hey, he's just that type of dude, man. Yes, sir. And so when he, he we talk about this story, about when uh, Hogan came with his son there, and I told him, man, you dropped the ball. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, he was shooting that show, Hogan's no best. You should have just jumped up and just popped Hogan in the mouth. I said, TMZ would have covered that all over the place. Guess what? Instant branding for the Count of Black Pearl, Reno, on Hawaii. Wow. Now that's that's the Samoan in me, like always thinking branding. <laughs> right. And this yeah. is a this is a true story. Yeah. I've heard it from multiple people. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh there was even a kind I, of a I, was it like a lightweight pull apart between Reno and Hogan? No, it, it was gonna get down. So it was almost yeah, yeah. it was almost like Yeah. You know what I mean? But what I'm saying is because Hogan didn't know he knows me. Yes, sir. Right? But he doesn't know Reno. Mm. And you know, that was one thing that I was if that would have happened, oh, I would have just worked it, not even tried to jump in and separate it. Because I would have just said, you go watch this guy. You go watch, get introduced to Reno on Hawaii. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? But, yeah, so they never locked hands or nothing like that. You right. know what I mean? But he was truly hot. The, it was seconds. And, it could it could have went down. It could have got yeah, ugly. Yeah, man. But to be able to, you know, kick him out and say, you know, you're out of here. And then years later, Hogan has never been to Australia. Guess who? Can book him to Australia. <laughs> yes, sir. Knox Pro Entertainment. Yes, sir. CEO of the company, uh, Reno on Ohio. Wow. Come on. Yep. Uh, wow. Gave I... him his chance to go to perform in, in Australia for the first time. Mm. WWE never took them. Right? And then we gave him five shows. He brought in Ric Flair because uh, he didn't want to work. We wanted to book him against Eki. He didn't feel he didn't want to work with Eki for whatever reason. Yeah, but, I mean, that would have been good because if that match would have happened, mm -hmm. I would have told my younger brother, turn it on on him. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I mean, knock the ball head off of him. <laughs> right? That's a whole other episode, by the way, the Australian yeah. tour. We're yes, going to talk about that. Before we wrap Please up do. this Bloodline uh, episode part two, I want to know from you, Big Quiche, yeah. what would you consider Yokozuna's greatest match? Wow. My, me personally, my favorite as a fan was WrestleMania Nine, uh, of course against Bret Hart, and he beat Bret Hart when when that dastardly well, Mr. Fuji threw the powder, you know, in his face, and he got the one, two, three. But on, from your perspective, what would you say is Yokozuna's greatest match? I, I would have to say going against Bret Hart. Yeah, because for me, like on a business tip, you know, this is friendship of these two gentlemen was pure and solid. And how they worked against each other was to highlight each other's strength. There was no ego. There was no one person being, you know, selfish. You know, they really, really perfected the craft and, and you know, Brett bought, brought the best out of, of Rodney. And Rodney threw out the best. Gave it all, you know, to be able to uh, be at that size of 600-something pounds and keep up with, man, the best there is, the best there was. The, the best be there ever will be. I knew you wanted to say that. <laughs> Nigga, you, you guys ought to see him laughing there. Uh, drop bombs on Joey. Give me, you know what? Give me a yeet, yeet for Joey. All right. So anyhow, Joey, TMD, he loves Brett. Hey, Brett, uh, if you're listening, buddy, one day can we please go have lunch with Joey? And Joey will buy dinner. He'll buy lunch. <laughs> but anyhow, so friendship, oh. they brought the best out of him. 
yes, each sir. other. Yes, sir. And so I, I'd have to say that match. So WrestleMania nine or WrestleMania ten? A ten. Yes, sir. That was a banger of a match. I didn't go well. figure. I think that's the same match where Yoko had to work again, right? Uh, was that? Like, there was it, Brett who worked twice. Oh, okay. I yeah, because he, he lost to uh, Owen first, and then right. he uh, won against Yoko. Which, yeah. man, that's such that's great storytelling. But we can get into that another day. Yeah. So Yokozuna's greatest match against Bret Hart is at WrestleMania ten. That would. I, I, that's you, what I would say. Would you consider uh, Bret Hart Yokozuna's greatest opponent because how they complemented each other in the ring so well? Yeah, there's, that's exactly on a, on a numerous level, yes, sir. You know, personal friendship. Nothing like uh, seeing two friends that, you know, truly love each other, have respect for each other, and to be able to have good, good, good matches. Yes, sir. Because Yogo held that belt for well over three years. So you imagine all the baby face he had to work with. So you, you can tell the big man when he's working, there, like he sees certain people like Brett. Mm -hmm. He smiles like it's a night off for him, right? Certain people that, you know, that in case they, you know, for instance, like Kamala. Love Kamala. But you can only, you're limited, right? Right, right, of course. Two yeah. big guys can only do so many two big guy mm -hmm. spots. So, But yeah, to be able to see the big man, you know, have a, a match with people that really, really can go and big man keeps up with them is just priceless. What was Yokozuna's favorite music? Oh, I'd have to say, hmm. Well, he's from the West Coast. It was hip hop, Every, right? Hip hop. Hip hop and Dr. Dre, the Chronic. I gotta, it's so you funny. know what I mean. I, I gotta tell the you, Chronic. This is about 1992, Oakland Coliseum. Mm. I'm in the back, yeah, and I'm watching. Of course, the wrestlers come in. Here comes Yokozuna. He's driving, and he has Mr. Fuji in the passenger seat. <laughs> First of all, I'm <laughs> blown away. He's driving. Yeah. He's behind the wheel, and he's bumping. Uh, Dr. Dre, Dr. The Dre. Chronic, G Thang. That's and it. this is when that song hit. Yeah. So my memory, I ha and I took a picture. I have a picture of it. Okay. Which uh, hopefully uh, I'll, I'll give to Frank or something. But um, he rolls up, and I think it was a Regal or something. It was it was, it was yeah. an OG ass car too. But he was bumping Dr. Dre, G Thang. Yeah. I'll never forget that. So would you say hip hop was that was probably his favorite West Coast music? One hundred percent hip hop. Yeah. Yeah, but well, he loved the variety. But West Coast because we were from the West Coast. Yes, sir. It's from the West Coast, and he just represents the West Coast. He's, you know, just a, a humble gangster. That's what the big man was. All right. You know what? There it is, man. Keish, I know you're a tired man. you got yeah, so man. much going on. Congrats again on your Funko Pop. Thank you, man. We're going to continue with the Bloodline Part 3 right on. next week. So before we get on out of here, do you have any last words? Hey, remember, as always, it's free to be kind to one another. And always, always smarten up. Mangoya. Mangoya.